This is the lecture in the slides um, for the last chapter we are covering in the GB3070 Economics and Global Defense Environment course. Um, we actually covered a significant portion of this chapter during class, um, but uh, I told you that I would cover the last parts. I would, of course, post the slides on, on um, Aplia, but then cover the last portions, you know, record myself. Um, in the meantime, in the process, however, um, I realized that this is one of those chapters where, it, particularly because it presents, you know, a different theory of determinants of things like output and interest rates, etc., than what we discussed in the long term or the earlier chapters. I therefore actually, in many ways, to get my own head around it, but also to explain it better to you, um, I actually totally revamped these slides. I basically researched more the principles that are in this chapter um, and how they relate to the principles in the previous chapters so that I could put them in a way, present them in a way that it would be a coherent whole as opposed to very disjointed from what we did before. So hopefully, you know, it, it took a little extra time, a little delay, and um, but hopefully it's worth it. But because of that, I am going to present in this uh, recording the entire chapter. Um, this is chapter, let's see, this is chapter 34 in the textbook um, on, you know, in Mancu textbook. I'm going to present the entire chapter, even though we covered part of it uh, at the beginning of, or during class, during our last class, um, just again so that I can have a, present a coherent whole um, uh, in the principles for this chapter. All right, so Again, the chapter is about monetary and fiscal policy, um, and it's ultimately it's motivated by this idea of what the government can do in the economy. We certainly, you know, the government gets blamed for economic woes and gets credit for economic gains, but what can the government actually do in the economy? What should they do in the economy? Um, and so the first topic is just understanding government intervention. So recall this diagram about fluctuations in the U.S. economy. This is in particular the unemployment rate. Right, where you see from 1965 to about 2015, 2014, you see uh, the unemployment rate is the green line going up and down with the shaded bars being recessions. And of course, you see that during recessions, uh, we have these big spikes in unemployment, right? which is a obviously a both political and economic concern. And the question is, can the government do something to smooth out these economic cycles? To, instead of having all of these ups and downs, can they um, you know, smooth them out? Um, and should it do so, right? Which is a different question. Can they and should they? So to give you the opposing views here, um, sort of the classic, you know, we've talked about Adam Smith and the invisible hand. And, you know, he would basically say, you know, in the long run, the economy works itself out. You know, recessions eventually turn back into growth and disequilibrium becomes equilibrium again. So the idea being just don't mess with it, it'll fix itself, right? In the long run, right? To which a John Maynard Keynes, one of the most famous economists said, but in the long run, we were all dead. Like literally, that's a quote. You know, the long run's not a good measure for because ultimately, in the long run, we're all dead. You know, it sounds great in theory, but um, you know, if we wait for the long run to fix itself, uh, it's you know, you know, too long for those of us who are here today, and certainly, obviously, too long for politicians to get reelected. And so, the idea here is so. So consider, for example, this idea of this is sort of measure of output over time, and. There's generally an increase based on technology and resources and you know labor and things that happen over time that we that that are the, the blue line sort of maps out the increase that the long run increase in uh, gross domestic product or potential gross domestic product. So the idea of what our um, you know full employment uh, output should be. Uh, and but the, we actually G, actual GDP fluctuates along these this red line. It's sort of a you know, a cycle up and down, above and below, sort of the long run trend. And we talk about, you know, sort of negative output gaps during recessions and positive output gaps where we're actually producing above the long run equilibrium output, right? And Keynesian economics basically advocates the use of fiscal policy and or monetary policy to reduce both negative and positive output gaps, right? So, um, you know, obviously to recover from recession and, and maybe uh, cool down the economy when it might be overheated and it might be um, above the actual long run uh, productivity, right? Um, so how do you do that? You know, and well, Keynes, here's a cartoon about, you know, sort of describing Keynes as, you know, about, about particularly at least with fiscal policy. It's Keynes said government could counter the business cycle by doing the opposite of everyone else. The government should act crazy, right? 
to oversimplify. You know, in a slump, Keynes said to pump up the economy with deficit spending. So when everybody else is not spending, government should, right? In a boom, tax more and spend less. Refilling the treasury and deflating 1920s style lunacy. So the idea that you know when when you know everything's growing, everybody's spending like crazy, the government should stop spending, right, and should tax more and spend less and should basically have the opposite effect of whatever the rest of the people in the economy are doing. Um, so think about government intervention in the economy. Understand that you know sort of the things that are going to dictate it and what government does are are of course politics, election outcomes. Right, but also the economic conditions. Um, economic, the election outcomes, of course, you know, are going to choose president and Congress, and the economic conditions are going to are going to be influence the behavior of the president and Congress, but also the Federal Reserve, which we mentioned was sort of a quasi government agency. It's uh, semi independent, certainly from from the government. The president and Congress are going to determine fiscal policies, which we'll talk about in a second, and the Federal Reserve primarily, but with the influence uh, and approval of Co President and Congress, will dictate monetary policies. So what are these? You know, the government intervention can fall into monetary policy or fiscal policy. Well, monetary policy is basically about uh, influencing the money supply and the interest rates. Um, and fiscal policy is about government spending and taxation. Right? And with these two different tools are the ways the government intervenes and influences the economy. So let's talk about the first influence of monetary policy, which will actually be uh, a majority of our discussion, uh, primarily because it's, it's a little more complicated and it requires, you know, uh, more theory than, uh, it's a new theory that we haven't done so far. Um, so let's think about the influence of monetary policy. So again, monetary policy is about influencing the money supply and interest rates, and or interest rates, or as we'll see, influencing interest rates by influencing the money supply. So Again, monetary policy is defined as sort of management of interest rates and money supply by the central bank. In the U.S., it's the Fed. Now, what we typically hear about and what the Fed typically does, they seek to target or influence interest rates. But it's important to understand that, you know, although they directly control the discount rate, which is the rate at which they loan to banks, other than that, they don't control directly any other interest rates. And therefore, how do they influence interest rates? Well, the instrument they use to influence interest rates is the money supply. They change the money supply increase or decrease the money supply to uh, raise or lower interest rates, right? And so here's a cartoon which captures it, you know, well, as we see that, you know, big pumping of money into the economy and the technicians, you know, sort of changing the gauge there. And this is, I suppose, the Fed chairman saying, you know, and this is where we adjust the interest rate, right? So again, it's, it's the money supply that is used as the instrument to ultimately change interest rates. So monetary policy can be either expansionary, right? So this is the idea of when they're trying to increase the money supply and or decrease interest rates, right? Which is the goal there is to shift the aggregate demand curve to the right, so increase aggregate demand, which will help speed up the economy and or increase growth, right? That's sort of expansionary policy. Contractionary monetary policy would be to do the opposite, to decrease the money supply and or increase interest rates, right? To shift the aggregate demand curve to the left and help slow down the economy and or reduce growth when it's, you know, overheated. Um, so, for example, we tend to think about, you know, promoting recovery from recession. Well, when, when we talk about recovering from recession, the FUD is, Fed is seeking to cut interest rates, right? You know, like the Uncle Sam here with his uh, sickle or a scythe, you know, and the goal is to revive investment spending, right? The lower interest rates um, lower interest rates will promote, you know, more borrowing, more lending, and more borrowing, you know, from the banking sector. Um, then, which promotes, of course, more spending, which is more demand, and ultimately more jobs to recover from the recession, recessionary gap. Um, and again, when we talk about, you know, this idea of so, why is it the focus on reviving investment spending? Remember this diagram from last, or second to last class, or, or no, it was in our last class actually. Um, Which was the idea that that um, you know when we think about sort of investment spending, it was only about one seventh of gross domestic product. But again, if we look at these recessions, which are the red bars, right, we see that during recessions, right, investment accounts for two thirds of the decline of gross domestic product. So even though it's only one seventh of gross domestic product, it reacts much more strongly, and particularly more negatively, you know, during recessions. And so therefore, sparking or reviving investment spending is sort of key to you know getting the economy out of recession. All right, so. That's sort of the big picture on, on the point of monetary policy, right? The idea is monetary policy is to, uh, 
adjust the money supply in a way that influences interest rates, which influences investment spending, which influences aggregate demand. Right? Well, when we're talking about the money supply as the instrument, we have to really understand where money demand comes from. So consider, to understand the demand for money, consider that we have two potential or two primary uses for your wealth. Right? You know, of all your wealth you have, your cash, your assets, etc. You know, it basically, it comes down to spending or savings. Right? And so, if you have uh, certain financial wealth, well, um, spending is, of course, immediate consumption of goods and services, right? You're going to spend it now, you know, you're going to use your money, you're going to spend it. Um, but to do that, you know, spending requires money, right? And in particular, requires currency or demand deposits, things you can use to pay uh, for goods and services. Uh, the benefit of these, you know, currency and demand deposits are liquid, you know, they can be used, they can convert, be converted to the medium exchange very quickly, they can purchase goods and services, but they don't earn any interest, right? You don't earn interest on dollars that are sitting in your wallet, right? Um, of course, the more spending, the more people spend of their wealth, that will increase the money demand, because you need more currency, more demand deposits, which are, of course, uh, money. Now, on the other hand, if you put it towards savings, that's actually shifting consumption to a later time, where you're actually uh, choosing to consume, just not now, right? I'm, I'm going to save that consumption for later, I'm going to save it for a rainy day, I'm going to save it for the future, for, you know, college or my kids or whatever it might be, but you're shifting consumption to a later time, and you're doing that unless you're putting under a mattress with, you know, savings deposits, stocks, or bonds. You know, these are uses of your wealth that earn interest, but they're illiquid. You can't, you know, uh, go and pay for a hamburger with a, you know, shares of Apple stock, right? You have to, you know, convert it uh, to the medium of exchange. So, again, you have spending requires liquid wealth, which is money, and savings is illiquid wealth. Right? And so therefore, the more savings there are, the lower the money demand in the economy. So again, now when we think about this, um, the money demand, of, you know, in that sense, reflects how much wealth people want to hold in liquid form. You know, uh, when you hold money, wealth in liquid form, when you hold money, you forgo earning interest, but you can use the liquid wealth to, of course, buy goods and services. That's the trade-off, right? Um, and therefore, a household's money de demand, how much money they demand, reflects its preference for liquidity. How liquid do they we want to be? Which is why we are going to be developing the theory of liquidity preference. Right? It's based on this idea of how much people, you know, assuming money demand is driven by the demand for liquidity, about being able to um, have liquid wealth, have money, be able to spend it on goods and services as opposed to putting it in savings. Well, how, how much do you want that? Right? What is your preference for liquidity? Now, what's going to influence money demand, right? How much money you want to have, how much liquid wealth you want to have? Well, one is income, right? Which we know, of course, in the economy overall, national income is equal to national output or GDP, right? But, you know, you get more income, you have more income, then you want to buy more goods and services, right? Um, but in order to buy more goods and services, of course, you, that takes money. You need more liquid wealth, um, and so that's going to increase the money demand. Price level. Of course, uh, you know, if we've already talked about this in the quantity theory of money, if the price level goes up, you know, obviously all goods and services cost more, right? So even if you don't buy any more goods and services, you buy the same goods and services, you need more liquid wealth, you know, or money um, to buy the same goods and services, right? So that's also will increase money demand independently, right? And increase in income, increase in price level, both will increase money demand. The interest rate actually, has, though, has an inverse relationship with money demand. Think about this, right? If you hold money, you earn no interest. If you put your money instead into savings, you earn interest, right? So you could either put your money or your wealth towards spending or savings. You put it towards spending, you can buy goods and services, but you don't earn interest. You put it towards savings, you can earn interest, but, but you can't use it to buy goods and services, at least not easily or quickly. Therefore, the interest rate is basically the opportunity cost of holding money, right? The, the, the money you're not earning or the, the wealth you're not accumulating because you've got dollar bills in your wallet or in your checking account. And so... If the interest rate goes up, right, then you're going to want to, you know, have more of your money earning interest, right? And so you're going to have more wealth transferred into savings, and you're going to reduce your money demand, right? So the interest rate works in an opposite effect um, from the income and the price levels, the inverse relationship with money demand. Now, this diagram here um, is complicated, uh, but it is really the driver of this entire lecture. In other words, when I 
said, okay, I've got to present this in a way that makes a lot of sense, which you know meshes with the previous theory, which explains why we're presenting some different ideas in the long run over the short run. Um, I had to get my mind around it, around the relationship of everything, and, and, my, and my mind was basically creating this diagram. And so this chart, uh, like all the complicated, really captures um, very much the theory we're about to talk about, the theory of liquidity preference, but also you know, how it relates to the long-run theories that we've talked about so far, like the quantity theory of money. So we said for the uses of wealth, there's either spending or savings. Let's consider spending, right? Um, spending, you know, is basically consumption. You know, it's a, it's a, the, co the consumption component of GDP. It's, it's, it's consumer spending, right? The more consumption there is, the more greater the money demand. The lower consumption is, the lower the money demand, right? Well, what is going to drive consumption, right? Well, it is a function of income, Right, we sort of just talked about this. The idea: the more um, income you have, the more you want to spend. Therefore, the more goods you want to buy. Therefore, the greater your money demand. Right. Well, what's going to drive income in the long run? Well, of course, income is equal to output. So it's equal to sort of the long run trend is basically our potential output or our well, our full employment output. Right. So it's you know, labor, capital, technology, natural resources. These are the things that are going to determine the potential of the economy and therefore the, what we can produce. These are things that are changing over time. But the long-run drivers of income are those variables, labor, capital, technology, natural resources, etc. Um, and so the overall income is going to therefore be you know, dictated and driven by that vertical long-run aggregate supply curve. In the short-run drivers, of course, we saw um, in our last class, you know, that, that aggregate supply in the short run is not upwardly sloping, I mean, not not vertical, I'm sorry, but it is it is upwardly sloping, but it's not perfectly vertical, aggregate demand. And we saw how shifts in aggregate demand and aggregate supply can affect output and therefore income in the short run. So again, you know, in the long run, we end up going back to the vertical long run aggregate supply curve, right? But the short run drivers uh, are influenced, income is influenced by aggregate supply, aggregate demand. Well, the other influence, there's another variable that influences, of course, the money demand here or spending, right, which is prices, right? The higher the prices are, right, then for any given level of consumption, the higher dollar value that is. So higher prices mean higher money demand, lower prices mean lower money demand, right? In the long run, right, remember the th quantity theory of money. We said the long run, in fact, that was, you know, one of the 10 principles of economics, right? The long run drivers of increases in price level are increases in the money supply, right? And uh, I'll talk about, I'll review that quickly or we'll go over that a bit. But again, money supply is going to drive price levels in the long run. Higher money supply, higher prices. Lower money supply, lower prices. In fact, proportionately. Right? We'll talk about that in a second. But in the short run, the big thing to understand is that prices are sticky. Prices and wages, prices which include wages, are sticky, right? The idea is whether it be based on contracts, whether it be based on menu costs, or whether it be based on um, social norms, you know, that we talked about not lowering wages just because there's a recession. The bottom line is that these things, prices and wages, tend to be sticky in the short run, right? Um, they ultimately are can be influenced and will change. And obviously, we talked about aggregate demand and aggregate supply, right? Uh, can change the price level, but they tend to be sticky. Right? At least some prices tend to be sticky. So, savings. You know, the other, the other use of wealth, of course, is savings, right? You know, but we said higher savings means lower mo lower money demand. Lower savings equals higher money demand. Right? The inverse relationship uh, between savings and money demand. Now, the interest rate, of course, what's going to drive the savings? Well, it's a function of the interest rate, right? If there was no interest rate, you wouldn't care about savings. You keep all your money on liquid wealth. But, you know, the interest rate is your return on savings. Lower interest rates you know, um, uh, uh, are going to... Whoa. This is the opposite, actually. I'll, I'll have to fix that. But lower interest rates are going to drive... Uh, uh, lower savings, right? Because that's less, less return on savings, which is going to mean that you're going to have more of your wealth in money. So it's going to increase my demand. So these are going to be the opposites. Um, and an increase in the interest rates uh, is going to increase savings, right? And therefore lower my demand, right? The more it goes in savings. Right? Um, so we almost should just take this right there. And take this. Oops. Take this. Put it there. Uh, just to make sure there's no confusion, 
although this slide duplicates later and it'll be so it'll be <laughs> incorrect on the later slide but at least just here again to review um, higher interest rates means the benefit of savings goes up so there's more savings put more money in savings lowers money demand lower interest rates means that um, there's lower benefit from savings therefore you save less and it's going to you have more keep more of your wealth as money it's going to increase money demand well what's going to drive the interest rate in the long run remember we had the chapter on savings and investment um, the long run you know what drives the interest rate is the supply of loanable funds and the demand for loanable funds right? you know supply of loanable funds is savings the demand for loanable funds is investment right? um, what's going to drive those well think about the idea of, first of all, the demand. Let's hear the rate of the demand for loanable funds is based on the rate of return that uh, businesses expect. If I'm going to get a 10% return on some investment um, and I can borrow the money at 8%, then I'll do it. But if I have to borrow the money at 12%, it doesn't make sense. So, what really determines how much loanable funds are demanded at any interest rate is the expected rate of return of various projects or potential investments. Now, what is the, uh, the supply? Why? Well, how much are you willing to say, put into savings? Well, um, in the long run, right, the idea is, well, you know, what's in it for me in terms of what I can consume in the future versus now, which is really about the discount rate, right? How much is the future worth to you relative to the present, right? You know, is it worth 5% more to you to be able to have the money now? It's the time value of money, right? And so what is really the time value of money? Now, that, again, we said that's going to drive the interest rate in the long run. Now, in the long run, those things, in the short run, those things don't really change, you know? The, the, the value of tomorrow versus today doesn't change much in the short run, right? You don't suddenly say, you know what, um, I'm much more, say, fatalistic. I think I'm not going to live till, till next year or so now. I'm going to spend more money today or vice versa. I mean, the general, in the overall economy, you know, the, the, what consumers value future spending versus current spending is doesn't change much. And, and the rate of return, you know, certainly the economy goes through some booms and best cycles. But um, when you're, it's really driven by your expectations of long run, you know, returns. And so these things do change, but not much. And so instead, so those things aren't going to, so when interest rates go up and down in the short run, it's not because of really changes in people's discount rate or in the expected rate of return. Instead, as we'll see, it's really driven by money supply and money demand, right? Money supply and money demand, you know, changes prices in the long run, but because prices are sticky in the short run, we end up seeing it more in interest rates, right? Um, both, money supply drives both prices and interest rates, but in the short run, right, we, we see it manifest itself in interest rates. Um, you know, because it really it can't manifest itself in terms of the sticky prices. All right, so those are the drivers of money demand. Now, I want to understand, remember, the quantity theory of money. This is sort of a review of what we've already sort of presented, the quantity theory of money. Um, hold on a second here. Why is this? Hmm? There we go. So the quantity theory of money, right, um, is this part of, our, of the diagram, right? This idea that, you know, a... Increasing prices uh, increases, you know, the idea that 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 ultimately we, we know that higher prices mean higher money demand. But in particular, the whole coin theory of money was that higher money supply produces a higher price level, and lower money supply produces a lower price level. So it was this long run model of the impact of money money supply on prices. So you may remember this diagram where we had the price level on the on the right vertical axis. Right, and value of money on the left vertical axis because they're inversely related as the price, you know, as the, as the, you know, price level, I'm sorry, as the price level goes up, you know, from one to four here, the value of money goes down, right, and vice versa, right, because it's about higher the prices, the less any dollar can buy, the lower the prices, the more value of money dollar has, the more it can buy. And so a fall in the value of money, right, um, increases the quantity of money demanded by that, meaning, you know, if, if, a, if, you know, it takes one dollar, if it, to buy a donut takes, takes, you know, buy a dozen donuts takes two dollars, right, then uh, um, I will want to have a certain amount of money, but if it takes, you know, four dollars to buy a dozen donuts or six dollars, the, the higher the price is and therefore the lower the value of money, the more money I need to keep in order to buy that dozen donuts, you know, my, to consume what I want to consume. Right. Um, meanwhile, we said the money supply, of course, is set by the Fed. It's at some fixed value, you know, sort of regardless of the price level, the Fed's sort of determining the money supply, you know, based on, uh, you know, economic, but also, you know, policy concerns. Right. And what we said was then the idea is that 
the price level adjusts in the long run to, e to equalize money supply and money demand, right? which is then going to determine, of course, the equilibrium value of money. Right? And so, again, price adjusts in the long run to equate the quantity of money demanded with money supply. And so that is the primary impact of changes in money supply in the long run is manifesting itself in terms of prices, right? Increase money supply, um, increases prices. Right? For example, suppose the Fed does increase the money supply, they shift uh, money supply to the right, right? Which is going to lower the equilibrium value of money, right? Uh, but at the same time, raising the price level. So again, this was the quantity theory of money and the idea that 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 increases in the money supply increase, you know, the price level. But the problem, of course, is that prices are sticky in the short run, right? Because of venue costs, contract, etc. Right. So what is the short run effect of a higher money supply if not a higher price? If the prices can't really go up or they can't go up that much proportionally, then what actually happens? You you double the money supply, do you double the prices? In the long run, the answer is yes. But in the meantime, what happens? Right? And that's where we're going to get to this idea of you know, theory of liquidity preference is going to say you actually see it in interest rates in the short run, which interest rates can change hourly even. Um, another way we also derived the quantity theory of money besides the graph was sort of the quantity equation. Remember this idea we used the velocity of money, right? How many times a dollar bill sort of turns over or spent in the economy you know, in a given year. And the money supply times the velocity, so the amount of money we have times the number of times, uh, you know, you know, any unit of money is actually used, right, has got to equal nominal GDP, right? If, if, we, if we buy $30,000 worth of goods, you know, we only have $10,000 worth of money in the money supply, then that means that we must have, each dollar must have been spent three times for us to use $10,000 to actually buy $30,000, right? So that was the quantity equation. Uh, we said that, look, velocity is relatively stable. There's not necessarily any reasons to, you know, you think about velocity in the long run, it's relatively stable, um, and therefore that we said that money supply has to be proportional to nominal GDP, right? P times Y, you know, price level times Y being the real GDP or actual output. So a change in the money supply causes the nominal GDP to change by the same percentage. But since a change in the money supply doesn't affect, you know, the, the classical dichotomy doesn't affect any real variables, right? There's no reason to believe that change in money supply, at least in the long run, is going to affect real GDP. Right, because that's driven by you know technology, natural resources, labor, um, yeah, capital. Right. So therefore, if money supply, if V doesn't change, and money supply doesn't change Y in the long run, right, then money supply has to be proportional to P. Right. It, 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 you know, price levels change by the same percentage as money supply. You double your money supply, you double your prices. You cut your money supply in half, you cut prices in half. Right? And that was the another way of deriving the conclusions of the quantity theory of money. Uh, here, though, the problem is is velocity of money really that stable? I mean, we sort of told you it was, but is it really that stable? I mean, when you look at it more closely, well, here was the diagram I gave you about the quantity theory of money. So that this is U.S. nominal GDP, uh, money supply measured by M2 in this case, and velocity from 1960 to 2013. And you sort of see nominal GDP, of course, going up as money supply is going up. And the velocity of money staying relatively constant, right? You know, pretty, pretty stable. These are all indexed by 1960 values being 100. So the idea is that velocity of money in the long run seems to be really stable. But if you look at velocity on a year-to-year -year basis, right, here's actually the change in velocity, percentage change in velocity from year to year. Here's 1915 to 2002, right, the change in velocity. right? Uh, from one year to another, you know, velocity could be 15% higher one year, could be you know, 18% lower than that. I mean, the velocity does change from year to year. It does, obviously, because it goes back and forth, up and down, or in the long run, it stays about the same. But in any given year, velocity is, 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 is less stable in the short run. So is velocity really that stable? In the long run, yes. But in the short run, no. So what does that mean? Well, that means that, look, if, if velocity isn't stable, right, and prices are sticky, then you change the money supply right, um, you can actually affect real GDP in the short run, right? M can affect Y, right? Because this has to be true. M times V equals P times Y has to be true. So if M goes up, you know, um, and V is not constant, right? Or V can change, right? M can change, it can influence real GDP. And in, in particular, um, uh, you know, if, especially if, if prices are sticky, right? If V was constant and prices were perfectly sticky, M would go up by the same amount as, you know, Y. They would go, but um, 
because velocity is not constant, it, it can change, right? M can go up, uh, velocity can go down a little bit, but uh, and the result is it can be an increase in Y, but not by the same amount. But the bottom line is that the money supply can affect real GDP in the short run because velocity is constant or stable in the long run, but not necessarily in the short run. All right, so that was sort of the quantity theory of money and what we looked at before. We said, again, changes in the money supply primarily drove prices in the long run. Right? And money supply really didn't affect real things, like real GDP. But we just sort of saw that in the short run why that's not the case and why it can. So, which brings us to the theory of liquidity preference, right? which is this bottom thing here. Again, remember the arrows are messed up here. i got to fix those. But the idea that the, you know, the idea that the money supply and money demand um, actually, in the short run, drive the interest rate. Right? Let's see how that is. Right? So, Ultimately, right, the theory of liquidity preference is this theory that says that the interest rate adjusts to balance money supply and money demand in the short run. Right? Uh, you know, prices adjust to balance money supply and money demand in the long run, but the short run, that the interest rate does it because prices can't, because prices are sticky. So remember, we think about this. The interest rate is some payment to money holders for supply of their scarce resources, liquidity. So you got liquidity, you got cash, okay. Give it to me, let me invest it. You know, I, want, I don't have liquidity, I want some liquidity so I can make an investment now. You know, and those are the demanders of liquidity. Right? So, again, remember that we talked about how money demand was affected by you know income and prices, but money demand is significantly influenced by the interest rate in the sense that an increase in the interest rate, as we said, you know, means the opportunity cost of holding money increases. So, therefore, more wealth is transferred to savings, right? Which is going to lower the money demand. Right? The decrease in the interest rate, opportunity cost of holding money decreases, right? So, the you know you might as well hold more money, right? If the interest rate goes down, what's the big deal? Why would you put your money in savings? Just keep it in checking, right? And more wealth is transferred to spending instead, and that's going to increase money demand, right? So therefore, again, the money demand curve is downward sloping with respect to the interest rate, right? So the higher the interest rate, the lower the money demand. The lower the interest rate, the higher the money demand, right? And to think of, understand this, here's, here's a, a cartoon which sort of illustrates this, right? Um, you know, husband uh, balancing the checkbook says, hey, our savings account earned 14 cents this month. Should we, re should we reinvest it or take it out and splurge, right? You know, should we save or spend, right? When you're only earning 14 cents a month on your savings account, right? There's not a lot of incentive to keep it in that savings account, you know? You might, and so the idea is, again, as interest rates are low in this example, you know, that you, you know, would rather keep more of your wealth in liquid form in terms of money, and so therefore interest rates go down, money demand goes up. Right. So here's the again. So here we have the, the idea of the downward sloping money demand curve, right, with respect to to interest rate. Um, and so again, a fall in interest rate increases money demand. So that's how money demand relates to the interest rate. Now, of course, to get a supply demand, we have to go with the supply. Well, money supply, just like before, is controlled by the central bank. It does not depend on the interest rate. Right. In other words, the supply of money is stays the same, or at least doesn't depend on whether the interest rate is one percent, five percent, or even a thousand percent. It's it's dictated by choices of the Fed. How do we sort of operationalize that or depict that? We draw the money supply curve as a vertical line at the current money supply. So here, if we now remember in the quantity theory of money, the vertical axis was the value of money. Here, the vertical axis is the interest rate, right? So the money supply curve is vertical, right? So changes in interest rate do not affect money supply, um, is what that means, because that is fixed by the Fed. It's a quantity fixed by the Fed, right? All right, well, we've got our demand, we've got our supply, put it together, right? There's your money supply, money demand, the idea is that the equilibrium interest rate adjusts in the short run to equate the supply and the demand for money, right? when prices can't adjust. Um, so think about how does this work, you know, how, how do we you know, adjust to equilibrium? Well, think about, suppose the interest rate was above that, suppose the interest rate above R1 drawn here, right? Um, well, in that case, what that means is if we're above R1, right, then money supply at that interest rate is greater than money demanded, right? So there's more money out there than people want to hold. Right, uh, as money in either cash or, or demand deposits. So therefore, those who hold the surplus money, and they're holding, oh, geez, I don't want to hold this much money. What do you do with it? Well, you put it into savings, which is, in other words, buying interest-bearing assets. You know, um, So you put it into the supply of loanable funds, You know, whether you buy stocks or bonds or put it in your savings account. Well, as you, of course, you know, put more into your savings account, that's going to you know, lower the interest rate because there's a greater supply of, the, of, of loanable funds, whatever. That's going to lower the interest rate. Right? And so therefore, that's going to mean, that, okay, well, now at a uh, lower interest rate, there's not as much incentive for me to put stuff in savings, so people are gradually going to want to hold more money. That's going to increase money demand, you know, until money supply equals money demand. Right? 
Inversely, if the interest rate is less than the equilibrium interest rate, if it's below R1 here, right, then we have money demand is greater than money supply. You know, so the people want to hold more money than is out there. Right? Well, what does that mean? Well, then you got to take your money out of your savings. You got to take your money out of your bonds. You can take it out of your illiquid stuff and turn it to illiquid. So as people reduce what they have in savings, right? So reducing the supply of loanable funds, right? That's going to raise the interest rate, right? you know, um, and because it's going to, you know, the, the supply of savings that remains, you know, are going to be uh, commanding a higher interest rate. So as that happens, people slowly want to hold less money until we get and get back to where money supply equals money demand. All right. So that is the theory of liquidity preference. Um, and the, we talked about money demand, money supply, and equilibrium under the theory of liquidity preference. Well, now we can talk about, um, which is the whole point of this big bullet point, is the influence of monetary policy in terms of what about changes, what about shifts in money supply and money demand. But shifts in money supply, that is monetary policy. Let's see how that happens. Remember, we talked about monetary policy being about changing the money supply with the intention of changing the interest rate, which ultimately has the intention of changing, influencing the economy by influencing aggregate demand. Let's see how that happens. So suppose we have a expansionary monetary policy, um, and we're starting off with, this, with the, here on the left, we have the money supply, money demand, you know, uh, on the right, we have aggregate demand curve, right, um, uh, for price to vertical, overall price level, overall output. So suppose the Fed, you know, the Fed, of course, uses money supply to target the interest rate and they're ultimately to shift the aggregate demand curve. Well, how does that work? So, for example, increasing the money supply will lower of the interest rate. So, so here we see a shift out of the money supply. Suppose they, they have expansionary fiscal policy. So that lowers the interest rate, right? So the it'll lower from R1 to R2 if we switch from MS1, money supply 1, to money supply 2, right? Well, a lower interest rate, of course, increases the quantity of goods and services demanded. How? Because it increases investment, which again, remember, we saw how investment reacts very much more in the short run, you know, to these deviations, to recessions and, and um, um, booms, than does consumption or government spending or net exports, you know, but investment is the biggest effect here. And so you lower the interest rate, you get a shift in aggregate demand, you know, uh, to the right as, as um, investment spending increases. And you shift aggregate demand, of course, that is going to increase output. Right. It's going to increase output. For any given price level, we have higher output, which is what, you know, the idea is about stimulating the economy. So again, when the Fed increases the money supply, it shifts the money supply curve to the right, which lowers the interest rate, increases the quantity of investment at any given price level, and therefore shifts the aggregate demand to the right. What about the other supplies? Suppose the Fed you know, is a contractionary policy. The Fed could also use also decrease the money supply, which would, if they decrease the money supply, that raises the interest rate. So suppose they went from MS1 here to MS2, shift to the left. Now we've raised the interest rate right, by doing that. Um, which means that you raise interest rate. What is that going to do? That's going to uh, increase the cost of investment. Therefore, we have lower investment, right? So it's going to ultimately shift the aggregate shift, shift an investment back, which can reduce investment, which is going to shift the aggregate demand curve left, right, and reduce the quantity of goods and services demanded. Right? And that's sort of contractionary uh, fiscal policy. Right? Again, so when the Fed decreases the money supply, it shifts the money supply curve to the left, it raises the interest rate, reduces the quantity of investment at any given price level, and shifts the aggregate demand to the left. All right. Well, what about shifts in the money demand curve, right? So that's shift in the money supply curve. That's really the primary topic here. But, you know, hey, let's not forget good old money demand because that can change as well. In particular, remember, uh, we said these different drivers um, of the money demand. One was the interest rate. And we said, again, but that is, that's our diagram. We go back, you know, changes in the interest rate, you know, that's our vertical axis in the, in, in the theory of liquidity preference. So that's movement along the money demand curve. Right? That's changing the vertical, you know, the, the interest rate. So that's that. That's what we call the liquidity effect. It's liquidity preference, right? So movement along the money demand curve, you know, for change in interest rate. Um, change in income, though, is of course a shift in the money demand curve, right? It's not reflected. It's not in the vertical axis. So therefore, income goes up, uh, money demand goes up. So that's got to be a shift in the money demand curve. Right? It's called the income effect. And change in prices is also going to shift the money demand curve, right? And that's called the price effect, right? Increase the price level, increase money demand. All right, well, so these are shifts. The top two are sh potential shifts or common shifts in the money demand curve. So let's look at their, how they work. So suppose we have a uh, um, change in income, which is going to shift the money demand curve. So here, you know, here's the income effect. If suppose we have an increase in income, right, as we sort of said, that shifts money demand to the right. right? Uh, when you shift money demand to the right, what's that going to do? That's going to raise the interest rate. 
Right? So if money supply stays constant, increase in money demand is going to shift the or going to increase the interest rate. Right? So that's the, what's called the income effect. Um, what about a shift of the money demand curve caused by the price effect? Right? So again, let's suppose let's suppose that um, we have a decrease in prices, just to work conversely. So if we have a decrease in prices, that's going to shift everything's cheaper, so we need less money to buy the same amount of goods and services. That's going to shift money demand to the left, which will of course you know lower the interest rate. Right? And so those are the income effect and the price effect. Um, but knowing the price effect here, we can actually talk more about something we talked about before, which is remember this idea of what the slope of the aggregate demand curve. Remember, you know, why does it slope downward? It can't slope downward for the same reasons we said that um, you know a, a de the demand curve for individual products slopes downward because we can't substitute one product for another. We're talking about overall consumption, you know, overall demand. And we said, look, there's actually three reasons that the aggregate demand curve slopes downward. One is the wealth effect, which affects consumption. One is the in interest rate effect, which affects investment. And what is the net? one is the exchange rate effect, which relates to net exports. Now, let's think about each of these. First thing about the wealth effect, right? The idea, what we said here was, look, as, as prices go down, right, then the value of the mo your money holdings goes up. And therefore, people, you know, you got more cash in your wallet and your checking account. You can do one or two things to it. You can move it to the savings account or you can spend it, right? And so, therefore, you know, you have more value your money holdings. Part of that gets spent on consumption. Therefore, you know, it increases consumption. That's the wealth effect. And that's why lower prices equal increased aggregate demand, why the aggregate demand curve slips downward. You know, uh, part of the explanation is the wealth effect. Uh, so, but the thing is, money holdings as a percentage of your wealth, what you have in your, is in, in, in American general, Americans general, what you have in your wallet and in your checking account as a percentage of all your wealth, including your, you know, real estate, your stocks, your bonds, your retirement, and your savings account, money holdings are a small percentage of your wealth. So therefore, it, it, there is some effect, but it's relatively small. It's not you're increasing the value of your money holdings, right, uh, when prices go down. Right, but but overall, it's not. Um, it's only affecting a small percentage of your wealth. So, so the wealth effect is actually relatively small. It does contribute to a downward sloping aggregate demand curve, but it's relatively small. Exchange rate effect. This is the idea that look, you know, lower prices, stuff is cheaper in America. Um, therefore, we export more. People buy more American stuff. They buy less foreign stuff. Lower imports, higher exports. So an increase in net expenditures. Right. Um, I'm sorry, net um, exports. But again, net exports, it's only about 2.7% of GDP, so it's a small percent of GDP, so it's not um, having a big effect um, uh, on, on the downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Right? Um, and which leads us with the interest rate effect. The interest rate effect, again, the idea that lower prices um, mean that uh, uh, the people want to lower their money holdings, right? which therefore they transfer to savings, which lowers the interest rate, which increases investment. right? And this is actually the most oops, the most important reason the aggregate demand curve slopes downward, at least for the US economy. Right? And so we can explain this better now um, with what we've, now we have the theory of liquidity preference. It allows us to better explain right, uh, how the interest rate effect works. So again, the idea being that, look, a fall in the overall price level reduces money demand. So it shifts money demand curve to the left. right? Um, so Prices go down, reduces money demand, so money demand curve shifts left. Um, and when you do that, that lowers the interest rate. Right? Well, a lower interest rate is going to increase uh, investment, right? Um, and so therefore, you know, the fall in interest rate increases investment, the quantity of goods and services demanded. So in other words, you know, uh, the impact of, you know, prices go down, right? That affects the interest rate, which increases investment, which is that's the again, the primary reason in the U.S. economy why the aggregate demand curve slopes downward, meaning why aggregate demand goes up when prices go down. All right, well, so that's sort of we covered again now changes or shifts in the money supply and sh shifts in the money demand. The last thing is sort of long-run adjustment, right? Because this is sort of putting it all together. This is very much sort of, you know, maybe the confusion that motivated me to sort of recreate all these slides. The idea that, look, in the long run, we said you know, let's think about the long run versus the short run. What we've said was in the long run, right? What's going to drive overall output of the economy? Well, it's going to be capital plus labor plus technology plus natural resources. That's going to determine output in the long run. You know, what's going to determine interest rate in the long run? Well, it's supply and demand for loanable funds. What's going to determine the price level in the long run? It's the supply and demand for money, determining the price level, right? But in the short run, things are different because, first of all, prices are sticky, right? So here, you know, that's not going to change. The price level is not going to change much in the sh as much. It'll change some, but not as much in the short run. So therefore, the supply and demand for money um, 
as, as supply and demand for money changes, right, will it be reflected in the price level? Yes, it will, but much less in the short run than it ultimately will in the long run. So what else sort of, what's the ripple effect? Well, we see the supply and demand for money influences the short run interest rates. In the long run, interest rates will adjust backwards. We'll talk about that. But in the short run, it's going to manifest itself in the interest rate. Um, and then, of course, the interest rate is going to influence aggregate demand, which is going to increase uh, influence output. Right. So you can actually influence real, not just nominal, real output in the short run. Right. Uh, because of this. Right. Because uh, in 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 the, in the short run, aggregate demand, you know, can be influenced. So. The idea is again, you know, we had these. Remember these short runs. Here's our short run you know, supply and demand diagrams. On the left, we have you know how, how aggregate demand is you know influences uh, your short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So you have a shift here in this diagram of aggregate demand, which is going to you know have some increase to the price level. Notice it, it because short run aggregate supply is not perfectly vertical. Prices don't go up by as much as aggregate demand shifts. If it did, you know that that's in the long run it will, but in the short run it doesn't. So prices do go up. Just not as much because they're sticky, right? But that'll increase output, increase prices, um, and what is going to determine, of course, the you know so that's sort of the output and price level determined by short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand in the short run, um, and by the money supply and money demand then are going to drive the interest rate, right? Um, but you know nothing is sticking in the long run, right? This is all sort of based on some stickiness. Remember the short run aggregate supply curve. The reason it is not perfectly vertical, the reason the short run aggregate supply curve is has an upward slope but is not perfectly vertical. Right is because of the sticky wage theory, sticky price theory, and misperceptions. Right, these are all things that correct themselves that unstick in the long run. So in the long run, we gave these models. Right, uh, you know, output and pri you know, capital plus labor plus resources plus technology. Right, that determines this natural rate of output or, or where the long run aggregate supply curve is. So that's going to determine your output, no matter where aggregate demand is. You you know, your your long run aggregate supply is going to be vertical there. That's going to be your output. Uh, the supply and demand for money. Right is going to determine the value of money and the price level. So this is the diagram here that determines the, the price level. Uh, so the price level is determined by supply and demand for money in the long run. And the interest rate is determined by the supply and demand for loanable funds in the long run. Right? So we have a little bit different models in the short run versus the long run. Right? So how do we sort of think about put this together? And, and the, the reality is that there's these effects that work in opposite directions. So the truth is that whereas the Fed tries to, of course, influence the interest rate in a way that affects aggregate demand in the short run, right? In, in a way that they couldn't in the long run. But you have to understand that, that the long run or medium run impact of monetary policy may actually offset the short run impact. Generally it does, it's just a time lag. You know, in other words, consider what happens, the short run versus long run impact of an increase in the money supply. So if you increase the money supply, right? The liquidity effect is what we just described in the short run, right? You increase the money supply, that lowers the interest rate, that increases investment, that increases aggregate demand, and therefore increases real output in the short run. But in the long run, one thing that has, for example, is the income effect. Well, if you increase real output, right, that's going to increase income. You know, if you increase income, you're going to increase my demand. You increase my demand, that's going to raise the interest rate. So you just lower the interest rate, but the, the, the long run, the income effect, will actually raise the interest rate. And also the price effect, right? If you've increased aggregate demand, you shifted aggregate demand to the right, right? You've also increased the money supply. Both of those are going to increase the price level, right? Increase the price level, that's going to increase money demand, right? Which is going to increase the interest rates. So again, you'll see that the short run effect of an increase in the money supply is to lower interest rates, but the long run effect ends up being to raise interest rates. So what happens? So again, so think about this way. So the idea is here's, here's the, again, the interest rate in the vertical axis, money supply in the horizontal axis, or money on the horizontal axis. Um, what happens is, is, you know, item one here, so if you increase the money supply, it will shift the money supply curve to the right, right? Which takes us from point one to point two, right? So that, that what happens is it causes a decline in interest rates. So the, the money supply curve shifts to the right, and uh, therefore interest rates goes down from R1 to R2. But over time, this leads to, you get, so you, you get, interest rate goes down, aggregate demand increases, it's gonna to lead to higher incomes and prices, which is going to shift the money demand curve to the right, which gets us to point three, and so we've gotten back to the original interest rate, right? Um, and so if you just then, let me just, so from this diagram to this diagram, I'll have changed the horizontal axis to change it to time. What you'll see happens is, is something like this happens over time. What that means is, you know, from time one to time two, so time one, the, the Fed increases the money supply. Right? They increase the money supply and the liquidity effect dominates, which means that the, the, because it's more of a short run effect. And so the interest rate goes down. Right? 
Um, and that was the goal of increasing the money supply. But, you know, from time two to time three, the income effect and the price effect dominate, and they're, they're going to be stronger than liquidity effect, and they're going to increase the interest rates, you know, as a result of the increase in money supply, right? And ultimately, to get to time three, where the interest rate returns to its long run level. So, again, understand that what the Fed is doing is, is they lower interest rates, but really for a short run, you know, uh, increase in aggregate demand and change in inter investment, right? All right. Um, all right, and so that's sort of the, the, the long run sort of adjustment, how, how putting together, if you will, the long run theory which we gave you about money, to, money supply, money demand, things like that, interest rates, and the short run the story I just gave you. All right. So now we, th then the issue, less complicated, I think, you know, is, this, is the uh, other way that the government influences um, the economy, which is fiscal policy. So again, remember over here, we have monetary policy, which is affected the money supply and the interest rates. Fiscal policy is about spending and taxes, right? How much your government brings in, how much it spends. So fiscal policy, again, is defined as setting the level of government spending and taxation by policymakers, right? So in the long run, what's the long run effect of fiscal policy? Well, it can influence savings, investment, and growth, and, you know, invest in technologies that improves our, you know, our output. So you can affect, for example, long run supply and things like that, you know, in the, in the long run. But in the short run, fiscal policy primarily affects aggregate demand. Right? The what the what what uh, we you know consumption and uh, um, government spending and what we're demanding overall. So we can have again expansionary fiscal policy, which is the idea to increase government spending or decrease taxes. Right, it's going to shift aggregate demand to the right, help speed up the economy and or increase growth. Or contractionary fiscal policy, which is going to decrease government spending or increase taxes, shift aggregate demand left, right, and potentially help slow down the economy and or reduce growth. Now, again, the idea being, of course, you know, typically what happens here is that, that you know, you're using fiscal policy to, to spend, expansionary, is sort of spending your way out of depression or recession. Right? Um, one way to think about it is, you know, this cartoon helps emphasize it, you know, uh, Keynesian economics, you know, you know, the idea that here he says, you know, at a bar, my wife's a Keynesian. She's always spending herself out of depressions, right? That's the idea, right? Is that government should increase the spending um, uh, when there's a depression or recession to sort of help the economy recover. Um, now, we think about the fiscal policy, how it affects aggregate demand, right? The, it affects, it has two effects, right? Which work in opposite uh, dimensions. One is the multiplier effect, right? The basic idea being, you know, you, 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 you inject money in the economy, it's spent once, and then gets spent again, and it gets spent again, and it gets spent again. That's the idea of the multiplier effect, right? Um, the crowding out effect, though, right, is deals with how it actually, you know, the government spending uh, actually crowds out investment spending, right? And that it affects the interest rate and therefore reduces investment spending. So again here, I think this is Rio, a crowded beach in Rio. You get to think about the crowding out effect, right? So these two different effects in aggregate demand. So we'll talk about each of those. First, the multiplier effect, right? So here's the multiplier effect. The idea being that $1 spent gets spent again, gets spent again, gets spent again. So it's a multiplicative effect. So suppose the government buys $20 billion of planes from Boeing, right? So when it does it, it buys $20 billion of planes from Boeing, then government spending goes up by $20 billion. So therefore, aggregate demand overall, since government spending is, you know, aggregate demand is, you know, consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. So if government spending goes up by $20 billion, then aggregate demand goes up by $20 billion, right? So, um, and... The Boeing's revenue increases by $20 billion. Well, what happens to that revenue? Well, the revenue is distributed to Boeing's workers as wages, right, to its suppliers, right, for inputs, but also to its owners as profit or stock dividends. It ends up in somebody's pocket, right? And those people are ultimately consumers, and they spend a portion of that extra income, right? And so the $20 billion goes into somebody's pocket eventually, and, and that gets spent again, right? And the extra consumption causes further increases in aggregate demand. So the multiplier effect is the uh, sort of the additional shifts in aggregate demand that result when fiscal policy increases income and thereby increases consumer spending. So um, the idea being, look, so suppose we start off here with a certain price level, uh, certain level output, certain aggregate demand, right? The $20 billion increase in government spending initially shifts aggregate demand to the right by $20 billion, right? But then the increase in Y, you know, causes consumption to rise. So the government spends it, that money ends up in somebody's pocket. The, those households, those consumers then increase their consumption, right? They consume. So that's going to shift the aggregate demand curve further to the right. So the $20 billion shift ends up being a bigger than $20 billion shift because the money gets spent again and again. Well, how much? Well, how big is the multiplier effect? Well, it really depends on how much consumers respond to an increase in income, right? If Going back to this diagram, if if you spent 20 billion and went into consumers' pockets and they put pulled all that into the bank, 
right? It wouldn't increase aggregate demand any more than the 20 billion. Right? But we measure how much people actually consume out of new, more income by the marginal propensity to consume, right? Marginal, in other words, how much more you consume at the margin for each additional dollar, right? So the fraction of extra income that households consume rather than save is called the marginal propensity to consume. For example, suppose the marginal propensity to consume is to 0.8. Right, which means that you get a dollar, you spend it, you spend 80 cents of it, and you put 20 cents of it into savings. So if the marginal propensity to consume is 0.8, and the income rises by 100 dollars, right, then consumption rises by 80 dollars, right, and the other 20 goes into savings. Um, so, or under the mattress, I guess. So, what this means is, so think about the impact of that 20 billion dollar increase in government purchases. Well, first, it the change in government purchases of 20 billion dollars. So G goes up by 20 billion, aggregate demand goes right by 20 billion. Then the first change in consumption, that 20 billion, you know, gets spent. How much of it gets spent? Well, the marginal propensity to consume dictates how much of it gets spent. So the first change in consumption is MPC times the 20 billion. But then that gets money gets into somebody's pocket, gets spent again. That, the second change is, is going to be marginal propensity to consume squared times 20 billion, because it's going to be marginal propensity to consume times this first change, MPC times MPC times 20 billion, right? But then that all ends up in somebody's money, in somebody's pocket. So the third change in consumption is the marginal propensity to consume cubed times 20 billion, so on and so forth, right? And it's actually sort of an infinite sum of one plus MPC plus MPC squared plus MPC three cubed plus et cetera times 20 billion. Well, you think you've probably learned in financial management, if not, you, you know, that this is, you know, one plus MPC plus MPC squared plus MPC cubed in sort of an infinite sum comes out to one over one minus MPC, right? Which means that if the MPC is three fourths, for example, then the multiplier will be one over one minus three fourths or one over one fourth or four. Right. So if that's the case, then a $20 billion increase in government spending would generate an $80 billion of increased demand for goods and services. 20 times the multiplier of 4 equals 80. So, um, all right. Another approach we can use for deriving the formula is, is, is the following. Um, you know, you can, you can use sort of, you know, algebraically, think about this, right? That, that delta G be the change in government spending, delta Y be the ultimate change in uh, ag in, in output the, at the end of everything, and uh, uh, delta C be the ultimate change in consumption. All right, well, then we know that, of course, total output or total income has to be consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Right? Um, if you change government spending, it's going to change consumption. Um, you know, it might indirectly, but, but, but not directly change um, uh you know, investment or, or net exports, right? So, but but it's going to change consumption. So the change in in uh, government spending plus the change in consumption equals a total change in output, right? So therefore, what this means is so the change in consumption is simply the marginal propensity consumed times, right? So the change in consumption we can replace that by MPC times delta y, the change in income, right? Um, so now we got that delta y equals MPC times delta y plus you know delta g, right? Divide both sides, you know, and solve for delta y, and you get that the total change in income or output is equal to one over one minus MPC times delta g, and there, be, there, behold, is our multiplier, right? So again, another way to derive the multiplier. Right? Um, so again, so what we're saying is the size of the multiplier depends the marginal propensity consumed. You know, for example, if MPC is 0.5, the multiplier is one over one minus 0.5, or one over 0.5, or two. If MPC is 0.75 you know, multiplier is 4, MPC is 0.9, and then the multiplier is 1 over 1 minus 0.9, or 1 over 0.1, so the multiplier is 10. The idea is the a bigger marginal propensity consumed means changes in uh, income or output cause bigger changes in consumption, which in turn cause bigger changes in Y. Actually, oops, let me fix that. That should be G, right? So, hold on, so let me go back. So this says that... Uh, Adjust this here. There we go. Okay, that a bigger multi, uh, 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 bigger marginal currency consume means changes in government spending cause bigger changes in C, which in turn causes bigger changes in Y. So higher MPC, higher multiplier. All right. So that's sort of the multiplier effect of a chain of fiscal policy. What about the crowding out effect? Right? So what about this whole, whole crowding out thing here? Well, how does that work? Well, it works using some of the ideas we talked about before. So the this but it works in the opposite direction, right? So think about this: a fiscal expansion increases aggregate demand, which we said increased aggregate demand increases money demand, 
Okay, well, if you increase money demand, what's that do? It raises the interest rate. In, in the theory of liquidity preference, you shift money demand to the right, increase the equilibrium interest rate, which reduces investment, right? Uh, which then reduces the net increased aggregate demand. So you increase aggregate demand and ultimately then decrease aggregate demand. Um, this is called the crowding out effect. Right? So in other words, the size of the aggregate demand shift may be larger or smaller than the initial fiscal expansion, depending on whether the multiplier effect or the crowding effect is larger. Um, so graphically, how the crowding effect works um, is the following, right? So the $20 billion increase in, in government spending initially shifts the aggregate demand curve to the right by $20 billion, right, as we said before. But then when you do that, a higher income increases money demand, right? So money demand curve shifts to the right, which then increases the interest rate, right? But when you increase the interest rate, that reduces investment, which reduces overall aggregate demand. Right? So you actually have a, you know, ultimately the, the shift in aggregate demand might be lower than the total amount of government spending, right? Um, so they work at opposite effects. You know, now, change of taxes are similar, right? It, you know, a tax cut increases household take-home pay. It's, it's similar to government spending, right? And households respond by spending a portion of extra income, which again shifts aggregate demand to the right. But the size of that shift is also affected by the multiplier and crowding out effects, right? If, if you lower taxes, consumers, you know, spend more, which uh, again gets multiplied because they spend the money, which then gets spent, gets spent, but it also deals with crowding out because as they spend more, increases output and income, in, uh, which raises interest rate, which lowers investment, right? Um, another thing that when it comes to taxes, whether the households perceive the tax cut to be temporary or permanent, right? If you if you believe that the tax cut is permanent, right, that's going to change your consumption behavior more than if you thought it was temporary, right? And so a permanent tax cut will cause a bigger increased consumption than than a temporary tax cut because the people tend to the marginal propensity to consume is different from a permanent tax cut or increase in ta take home pay because of tax cut than than for a, a temporary one. So just to drill these ideas home, let me give you an example. Suppose the economy is in recession, and shifting the aggregate demand curve rightward, you know, by twenty two hundred billion dollars would end the recession. So we want to shift the aggregate demand curve right by two hundred billion dollars. How do we do that? So if the market propensity consume is 0.8 and there's no crowding out, how much should Congress increase government spending to end the recession? Right? And what if there is crowding out? Will Congress need to spend more or less than that amount? Well, let's see. Let's take the first part, A. So if the market propensity consume is 0.8 and there's no crowding out, how much should Congress increase government spending to end the recession? They want to shift aggregate demand curve to the right by $200 billion. Well, the multiplier, if the MPC is 0.8, the multiplier is 1 over 1 minus MPC, or 1 minus 1 minus 0.8, or 1, I'm sorry, 1 over 1 minus MPC, or 1 over 1 minus 0.8, or 1 over 0.2, which is 5. So the multiplier is 5, which means that an increase in government spending of $40 billion will shift aggregate demand by 5 times $40 billion, or $200 billion. So the government would need to increase government the, the spending by 40 billion in order to shift aggregate demand to the right by 200 billion, right? If the MPC is 0.8 and there is no crowding out. Now the second part says, well, what if there is crowding out? Will Congress need to increase government spending more or less than this amount? Well, crowding out reduces the impact of government spending on aggregate demand, right? So that 40 billion dollars spending will not shift the aggregate demand curve to the right as much. It won't shift it to the right by 200 billion. So therefore, to offset this, Congress sh should increase government spending by a larger amount. You have to spend more than 40 billion. You know, in the presence of crowding out, even if the multipliers is five, you're going to need to spend more than, than 40 billion to have a shift of aggregate demand curve by 200 billion. All right. So summary. Um, first, before the sort of summary side, I wanted to point out that the potential tug of war between monetary and fiscal policy, you know, they can both, of course, influence the economy in the short run, but sometimes they pull in opposite directions, right? And, and in fact, sometimes the monetary, the Fed is trying to correct for the impact of the fiscal policy, you know. Um, so, for example, here was some research done that said, like, in 2014, they estimated that U.S. monetary policy added roughly 3.2% to GDP, so it was expansionary monetary policy, but fiscal policy reduced GDP by 1%. So there's sort of this tug of war back and forth, right, which is... Not necessarily they're competing, but there may be other reasons. For example, the government's trying to balance the budget, maybe, and they, for they, 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 uh, you know, maybe they, um, uh, uh, you know, raise taxes and lower spending or whatever for for not economic reasons, but for budget balancing reasons or whatever. Well, then the Fed will say, okay, well, that's going to re reduce GDP, so I'm going to use expansionary monetary policy. So again, they sometimes work in opposite directions. And again, so, so understand that policymakers can influence aggregate demand with monetary policy one way, and they do that to increase the money, so they, they can either increase or decrease the money supply, right? If they increase the money supply, that causes interest rate to fall, you know, which stimulates investment and shifts aggregate demand curve to the right. A decrease in the money supply will cause the interest rate to rise, which reduces investment and shifts the aggregate demand curve to the left. 
Of course, they can also influence aggregate demand with fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy is about increasing government purchase or cutting taxes, which will shift the aggregate demand curve to the right. A contractionary fiscal policy is about decreasing government purchase or raising taxes, right, which will shift the aggregate demand curve to the left. Now, how much, you know, when the government alters spending or taxes, how much it shifts aggregate demand, it could be larger or smaller than the actual fiscal change. Reducing taxes by 10 billion may or may not shift, may shift the, you know, uh, aggregate demand by more or less than 10 billion, right? Um, and it really depends on these multiplier, multiplier effect and crowding out effect. The multiplier effect tends to amplify the effects of fiscal policy on aggregate demand, while the crowding out effect tends to dampen the effects of fiscal policy on aggregate demand. And finally, you know, I didn't talk too much about it, but, but the idea of, you know, the, 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 you can use both monetary and fiscal policy to influence aggregate demand and have to stabilize the economy. Well, should they do it or not? Economists disagree about the degree to which, at least, the government should be in this effort. You know, some say it's it's good the government should combat destabilizing fluctuations. It's not good for the economy. People like certainty, more stability. But others say, look, you know, it's, it ends up destabilizing the economy because the, the economy is going to adjust itself. And by the time the government takes action, it's almost, you know, too late. You know, you, you're you almost, uh, you know, by the time the, 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 not necessarily you take action, but you take action and your action takes effect, you ultimately might be stimulating the economy when you should be doing the opposite or vice versa. So, all right. So that's it. That's a story on monetary and fiscal policy. Right. We've again covered the general idea of why the government intervenes in the economy, how it can affect things, how um, they do it via monetary policy, and we had to introduce a new short-run model of um, the interest rates called the theory of liquidity preference, um, and the, so we understand and then the relationship between that and what we talked about in the long run, um, then the influence of fiscal policy, which is influenced by both the multiplier effect and the crowding out effect. All right, that's it, and that is the final lecture for GB3070. Thank you so much. And I hope, like I said, I significantly changed this. I hope the explanation, uh, you know, makes more sense for those who are trying to put, you know, all the pieces together. Thank you.